Okay, everybody, thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, we have a number of dedications, uh, plus some exciting news I'll announce in a minute. Uh, the year is dedicated uh, for Fuh Shlema to Bracha Ben Frida and for the lasting unity of the people of Israel and all of those whose health has been affected by the war. Aliyat Neshama for Yitzchak Hirsch Ben Eliezer, Leah Bat Mordechai HaKohen, whose upcoming yard site is the 23rd of Cheshvan. Uh, by her son, uh, Daniel Goldstein. Uh, number three, for the father of Hannah Firestone, Harav Yitzchak ben Shlomo Dov HaKohen, whose yard site is the 22nd of Cheshvan. I have to say that Hannah Firestone is uh, one of the closest friends of my wife, and uh, she actually is credit for being our Shadchan many, many years ago. So again, her, her father says, have an Elias Tashama. And tonight's class and the next five classes is dedicated Lezecher Nishmas, our parents, Rabbi and Mrs. Philip Finkelstein, by Ephraim and Naomi Finkelstein. Last week, you'll recall, that we had a dedication in memory of their mother. I've mentioned a number of times how the Finkelstein family were a major, major influence on myself and many, many kids growing up in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, they were doing Kirov before Kirov was a thing. And uh, really, many, many B'nai and B'nos Torah are in the world with their own families. Uh, because of the great, great work of the Finkelstein family. So Yehi Zichron, Zichron Baruch. Uh, an anonymous contribution was made for the Nitzachon of all of our Chayolim and the hostages to return safe and totally healthy to their homes. And we ask Hashem's protection, as always, for all of Klal Yisrael and for the Geula Shlema B'mheira V'yameinu. Uh, the exciting news is Yibana has finally found a permanent home which will serve as a great location to establish as a center for all of our activities that will actually include this year being relocated as well. Uh, Rabbi Poston just signed the contract and uh, he's in the process of heavy negotiations uh, to try to get it ready for the Kehila. It will be a hub for chesed projects, a study hall, a shul, classrooms, a kitchen for life cycle events, and even a weekly Shabbat Kiddush. I assume hot challenge, but I don't know, okay. Um, renovation on the property is now being performed, and the hope is to get it ready in just a few weeks, uh, and obviously uh, whatever help uh, you could extend uh, in this uh, wonderful project uh, would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Be as Rosh Hashem, it'll be a, huh? Where is it? It's on Amik Rafaim. It's a, is that above the bagel, the bagel place? Yeah, or? next to the bagel. Next to the bagel place, okay. So our target date to launch is very auspicious in time to celebrate Hanukkah. And this will be celebrating also the 10th anniversary of Yibana. And uh, everybody's invited and you can contribute directly uh, by looking at the uh, link in the description box in the, the YouTube page or the Yibana, the Yibana website. And uh, special dedications are available. Please contact Rabbi Poston at Aaron david at yibana.com. So once again, it's very, very exciting. And uh, Baruch Hashem, this will give uh, Rabbi Poston and Yibana a whole new opportunity for Torah and Chesed and Avoda, and uh, all of the people can be shutvim, can be partners uh, in those great endeavors. Uh, you know, people think sometimes after the Yom and the Ram are over, we no longer have to be concerned about Shuvah, Tzvila, Tzdaka. That's kind of a, an Elul, Rosh Hashanah thing. <laughs> That's obviously a very, very big mistake. Uh, we need the Rachamim of Hashem every day. And of course, all of us know that. We're still in the middle of a, of a war. And uh, the Rachamim of Hashem comes to Kal Yisrael through Shuvah, Tzvila, and Tzdaka. And uh, this is a good opportunity to kind of link to that, which should be a Zuchus for Am Yisrael, and should bring us closer and closer to the Gula Shlema, to the Bias, uh, Bias HaMashiach. Okay, so uh, this Parsha is a relatively short Parsha. Of course, as, as every Parsha, there's infinite wisdom and depth. So I want to start really with really two uh, semi-technical points, and then I'll go on to the main thing that I want to discuss. Uh, the first point is we begin with the death of Sara Imenu. Now, the Torah tells us that Sarah died at the age of 127, uh, which means Avram is 10 years older. Avram is 137 uh, at this particular time. Uh, there is an interesting medrash, and one could spend a lot of time on this medrash, that Rabbi Akiva was once darshaning, he was once explaining psukim, and people started falling asleep. 
course, for speakers, that's a great comfort, you know, because, you know, I speak, other people speak, and the audience falls asleep. But even the great Rabbi Akiva, people fell asleep, so shouldn't feel bad. And Rabbi Akiva figured out a zinger to keep them awake. And he said, Esther became queen. Esther Hamalka became queen. And she ruled over 127 Medinot, 127 provinces. <coughs> Why did Esther deserve to rule over 127 provinces? So Rabbi Akiva said, because she was descended from Sara Imenu, who lived 127 virtuous years, therefore Esther merited to rule over 127 provinces. There are some very, very deep associations between Sara and Esther, and I'm not going to go into all of that now, but the simplest meaning of the Medrash is, hey, that means every moment of Sarah's time turned into a zechus to rule over part of a country. If you break it down to acreage or square inches, that means 127 virtuous years gave her descendant 127 countries. So that means every unit of time that you don't lose, that you, that you misuse, you lose a country or part of a country. So he's trying to tell them, don't fall asleep. Be mach of your time. You know, when people say, I've, I'm killing some time, the Chavit Chaim used to say, killing time is suicide, because what is life other than a succession of moments? A person doesn't use a moment in the best way, then God forbid, it's as if they're taking part of their lives. And Rabbi Akiva is trying to tell them, look at every unit of Sarah's life resulted in a Medina, part of a Medina, part of a country. You never know the repercussions of your decisions. But there is a tradition that Rashi brings from Chazal that Sarah died out of the shock of the Akeda. Avram comes back and he finally tells her about this story and she dies. That's how we know that Yitzchak was 37, right? That the calculation is simple because uh, Yitzchak was born when Sarah was 90. Sarah died at 127. And if you say she died because of the shock of the Akeda, Yitzchak was 37 at the time of the Akeda. Right? That's, the, that's the proof. He was not a child. And presumably, as a matter of f physical strength, he probably, you know, if he wanted to get out of the Akeda, he could have defeated Avraham. But Yitzchak himself submitted. Now, there is a whole machlokas. What do we mean that Sarah died because of the shock of the Akedah? What exactly killed her? So the simplest meaning is that, you know, you almost killed our son? How could that be? But some of Farshim don't like that because they say Sarah was a tzaddikah, so it was even greater than Avram. She surely would have understood the great, great merit of the Akedah. So some say the opposite, that when she saw Yitzchak, knowing of the Akedah, she died because she thought Avram or Yitzchak or both failed the test. And that <coughs> killed her. And there's a third understanding from the Rebbe of, the Maggid of Kuznets, one of the early uh, leaders of Hasidus, that she died because her neshama wanted to participate in the sacrifice, right? Avram is willing to sacrifice his son. Yitzchak is willing to die. Sarah, as it were, also wants to have a chilek in giving her life for Hashem. It was like a spiritual akedah in that sense. So I had mentioned last week, I know the akedah was last week, but but since Sarah's death is connected to the Akedah, I had mentioned uh, the, the a few Midrashim and they part of the Zohar that we can't locate, but it's brought down to shame the Zohar, that some say Avram Avinu actually did kill Yitzchak on the Mizbeach. And this is the reference to the, in fact, not only killed Yitzchak, but perhaps even the ashes. The body was burnt. And that's the meaning of the statement that appears often in Tefillos. May Hashem remember the ashes of Yitzchak al Gabi and Mizbeach. There were no ashes, but according to these Midrashim, Yitzchak was killed and Yitzchak was burned. So I just wanted to add something very, very interesting that 
there are two versions of that story. Version one of the story is Yitzhak died, but immediately there was Du Min HaShamayim, Tau Min HaShamayim, that was Machaye Mason, that brought him back to life. And he came back with Avram, meaning to say he did come back with Avram. That's version one. But there's a version two that's much more dramatic. And this is from the Megala Amukais, who was one of the great, great, great Mikubalim of Nelson Shapiro, who actually says that Yitzchak was dead and Yitzchak was in Olam Haba for two years. And Avram came back to Sarah without Yitzchak. And that is why in Parshas Chai Sarah, when Sarah died, Yitzchak's not mentioned at all. But Yavo Avram, Avram came to cry over Sarah and eulogize her. There is no Yitzchak. And the Megala Amukai says Yitzchak was gone for two years. And that's why he got married at 40. Remember, Yitzchak, because the Akedah was age 37. Yitzchak didn't get married until 40. What took so long? Three years. Eliezer Shlichus was very, very quick. Remember, he got the Charan the same day. So what took three years? Why was there such a delay? So the Megal Amukos says, because Yitzchak was simply not there. Yitzchak was dead. Yitzchak was in Shemayim. As soon as he comes back, at the age of late 39, 40, Avram Avinu arranges the Shidduch. And the Megal Amukai springs... It's a bit of a complicated proof, but it brings a striking support to his thesis that Yitzchak was in Olam Haba for two years. And he says the following. The Gemara in Chagiga tells us that the distance between earth and heaven, whatever Shemayim means exactly, because there are seven Shemayims, is the amount of time it would take a person to walk 500 years. That's what the Gemara's shear is. That if you could somehow walk vertically, 500 years of walking nonstop would get you to Shemayim. Now, it says, we say in Kriya Shema, that Laman Yerbu Yemechem, God will give you long life. Al Adama, on the ground, Asher Nishba Hashem Lavosechem, that God has promised to your forefathers. As the days of the heaven above the earth. So the Megala Amukos interprets that the forefathers, the combined lifespan of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov equals the days of uh, heaven above the earth. Which means you should come up with a figure of 500 years. Because since from, heaven, from earth to heaven is 500 years, and the days of your forefathers are like the days of heaven upon earth. So the, com the combined lifespan of the Avot should be 500 years. Let's add it up. Abraham is 175. Yitzchak is 180. The Gemara? No, just the year, the year, not the Gemara, the years, yeah, yeah. And Yaakov is 147. So 5 and 7 is 12, 16 is 20, uh, 3, 4, 5. You get 502. How can you say that the lifespan of the Avot is 500 years, like the days of heaven upon the earth? You only have, you have a total of 502 years. Says the Megala Amukot that we don't count the two years that Yitzchak was missing. So although Yitzchak died at 180, he only had 178 years on earth, and therefore he wants to bring this as a raya, as a proof, that Yitzchak actually died, he was in Olam <coughs> Haba. As seen in that way, uh, the shock of Sarah can even be more understood, because quite literally, Avram came back without, without Yitzchak, without Yitzchak. And imagine the shock, uh, you know, Yitzchak Mamish comes back. Mamish, a miracle, a supernatural miracle of Tchiyas Hamesim. And the Mephorshim actually explained, this is why when Rivka, little Rivka, finally see, you know, sees Yitzchak, so it mentions she was so shocked, she fell off her donkey. She fell off. Uh, and the Mephorshim all say, because she saw a godly, otherworldly countenance, a person who was... An angel. The Megala Muko says 
this is what it is. He had been two years in Olam Abba. He really was not a product of this earth anymore. He came back as almost an angel. And therefore Rivka was in great, great awe of Yitzchak in, the, in that way. So again, this is such an interesting, unusual sheet of the Megala Mukas. I wanted to share it with you. Now one other point, before I get to my main point, uh, and that is, it says, Avram came, lispait l'sara, to eulogize Sara, v'lib kaisa, and to cry over Sara. To cry over Sara. So Rizal has pointed out that this is actually a bit of an unusual way of describing the sequence. The Gemara says the normal sequence of grief is you first you cry. You lose somebody, you cry. And then you organize your thoughts and you present some type of <coughs> eulogy of what she represented. Normally, Bechi is prior to Hespit. But here it says, Lispite. He eulogized, and then he cried. And the, the Nitzif says, the answer is, there's two types of crying that can exist when one loses a loved one. There is the spontaneous grief of loss. And that comes before you articulate the milus, the greatness of them. But then there's another cry that comes when you truly understand what they represented. Avram's crying is not just the crying of an emotional response to loss. It's a crying that comes after a reflection of what Sarah meant to him, what Sarah meant to a future Jewish nation, what Sarah meant to the world. And therefore, the deepest crying is not the crying that precedes Hesbet, eulogy, but the crying that comes afterwards. But, if you look at the word crying, lib chosa, you will see in the Chumash an interesting thing that the chaf in lib chosa is miniature, a tiny chaf. The chaf is diminished. Why is the chaf diminished? So the Balaturim gives what I think is a bit of a dochic answer. Meaning, even though he cried, he didn't cry a lot. It was a reduced crying. Because she was a cicada, she was old. So, you know, he had to die sometime. So his grief was not, or at least his crying, was not excessive. Okay, that's a bit of a dochek, because we assume no matter what, uh, the grief would be deep. Some say a little differently, that this is kind of another <coughs> kick in the teeth. He was told by God to kill his son. And Baruch Hashem at the last minute, so imagine what he went through. And the last minute Hashem canceled it. and said, oh, you misunderstood. I didn't say kill him, I just said to tie him up on the Mizbeach, etc. And like the Megala Mukos, he did kill his son. Right? Okay. And then he comes home, and when Sarah gets the news, she dies. For most people, God forbid, there may be a sense of bitterness, betrayal, anger at Hashem. So some say he didn't let himself tap into the fullness of his grief. Because chas v'shalom, that may have led him into resenting Hashem. So that was his greatness, another aspect of his greatness. He didn't allow himself the fullness of his feeling. If there was any danger, it would take him to a place of rejection or rebellion. So that's the small chaf. But there is a, an ingenious halachic explanation. Again, I, we don't spend a lot of time on halachic technicalities, but I'm going to spend a time on this because it actually is a halacha lemaisa that comes up a lot. So it's a good halacha to know. And this uh, parish, the Reisha Rav, Rav Aaron Levin, reads it into the small chaf. And that is, most Midrashim assume that the Akeda occurred on Rosh Hashanah. That that's why the optimal shofar is a ram's horn, to remember the Akedas Yitzchak. In the davening itself, we, we repeatedly mention the merit of the Akeda. So most say the Akeda happened on Rosh Hashanah. And yet, according to Pirkei de Rebbe Eliezer, 
The Akeda happened on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the day of the Akeda. So based on this, we can compute when Sarah Imenu died. Because she died when Avram told her about the Akeda. However you learn, whatever the reason, either the shock that he's dead or the shock that he would have died or the shock that he didn't die. and Whatever the reason is, it was the news of the Akeda that killed. Now we know that from where they were living to Mount Moriah and back is a three-day journey. So if the Akeda happened on the 10th of Tishrei, so the calculation is the three days of traveling would be 11, 12, 13. Abraham gets to Sarah on the 14th of Tishrei, which is Erev Sukkos, and that's the day that she dies. So Sarah Imenu dies on the 14th of Sukkos. Now, here is the thing. I'm sorry, the 14th of Tishrei, Erev, Erev Sukkos. Let's take Halacha Lamaisa. If somebody is buried, Erev Yomtif. Somebody is, dies, Erev Sukkos. And there's a Levaya. How many days do they have to observe mourning, going with Shloshim, going with the 30 days as the standard mourning? So the rule is this. If there's a burial, Erev Yom Tov, Shiva is only observed until the Yom Tov starts. Yom Tov cancels the Shiva. But there's another aspect of this people don't realize. It counts for seven days towards the Shloshim, meaning there's a mourning period of seven, but a mourning period of, 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 thir of 30. When Shiva is canceled, Erev Yom Tov, the small amount of time of Erev Yom Tov counts as seven days. So let's figure this out. So when a person is buried on Erev Sukkos, Erev Sukkos counts for seven days. Sukkos counts for seven days, because it is seven days, right? Uh, not towards Shiva, but towards Shloshim. So that gives you 14 days. Shemini Atzeres, which is a separate Chag, counts for seven days. It's interesting. Even though it's only a one-day Chag, but since it's considered to be one of the Regalim, it counts for seven days. So it actually turns out when a Kavura occurs on Erev Sukkos, Erev Yom Tov is seven, Sukkos is seven, Shemini Atzeres is seven. You have 21 days. So you only have to keep another nine days of Shloshim. Which means Shloshim will be over nine days after Sukkot. Now, in terms of actual mourning, how many days have actually been mourned? Erev Yom Tif. Yom Tif, you don't do mourning. Erev Yom Tif and the nine days after Shmini Atzeres. So it turns out, out of the 30 days of mourning, you've only done 10 of them. Meaning 20 of them have been canceled in various ways. So the reason why the chaf of Libkosa is small, chaf is 20, the number is 20, right? Is because 20 days of mourning were taken out of Shloshim based on these various cancellations. And the like. Again, it's a very ingenious, and again, this is a certain type of mahalach that tries, tries to read the halachic observances into the Avos, even though obviously the laws of Shloshim came much later. They're not even Doraisa, but we do have the Messira that Chazal say that Avram Avinu did keep all of the Doraisas and the Drabanans even before they were given. He understood this, so he would have kept the Shloshim, but based on the Cheshvan, that Sari Imenu died, Erev Sukkos, there were only 10 days of active mourning that he kept, uh, Erev Yom Tif, plus the nine days afterwards, and uh, there was no Shloshim after that, because Erev Yom Tif counts for seven, Yom Tif counts for, uh, Sukkos counts for seven, Shemini Aseris counts for seven, 21 days, nine days after Yom Tif, so the nine days after Yom Tif, plus the uh, one day Erev Yom Tif, adds up to 10 days, so out of the 30 days of Shloshim, only 10 days were kept. Therefore, 20 days were taken out of the morning ritual. 
and that's why the chaf is small. To be aware of the halacha of what happens when somebody is buried uh, Erev Yom Tif. Uh, I guess the biggest Chiddush is that Shmini Yatseris counts for eight days towards Shaloshim. That, that's a big Chiddush in which one day you're almost tempted to apply a, a time compression or a time relativity, uh, Einstein type of thing, that somehow one day counts as eight days. I'm sorry, one day counts as seven days uh, for purposes of the Shaloshim calculation. Okay. So sorry, Menu dies. And there's an immediate need to get Yitzchak a wife, and the, the, the rest of the Parsha is fundamentally devoted to Avram Avinu, sending his servant, his faithful servant Eliezer, on a shlichus to find a wife for, for Yitzchak. And again, there are a few important things to notice, that uh, Yitzchak is the only one of the Avos who doesn't get his own wife. Avram's marriage to Sarah, we're not really given really any details, like, you know, how did they meet, you know, etc. Obviously, they're related. Sarah is Avram's niece. Uh, we're not really told about the Shidduch process. Yaakov Avinu, of course, we're told in great detail about Rachel and Leah and Bila and Zilpah. And Yaakov went to Haran. Yaakov went to Besuel's house and Levan's house uh, to find, find a, a wife. But Yitzchak is not allowed to leave. And as Rashi points out in the name of the Medrash, that because Yitzchak was sanctified as a korban, and of course, like the Megal Amukos, even more than that, Yitzchak was mamish nichnas to olam haba for two years, Yitz Yitzchak's kedusha did not allow him to leave Eretz Yisrael. We see that explicitly, by the way, in next week's Parsha, when there's a famine and when Avram had faced a famine, Avram was told to go to Mitzrayim. Hashem told Yitzchak, you don't go to Mitzrayim. So we're reading it here as well. Yitzchak cannot be Osei in finding his own, his own shidduch. So Avram gets his faithful servant Eliezer. Now, and it's a very long story, and uh, there's a lot of repetition in the story. Because here it is. The, to the Torah tells us what Avram's, Avram's conversation to Eliezer it talks about Eliezer devising a plan. It talks about the plan being carried out. And then, when Eliezer finally comes to Lavan's house, you know, Basuel and then Lavan, Basuel dies, so it turns out that Rivka's brother is doing most of the negotiation. Eliezer recounts the whole story. In other words, the Torah describes a narrative from A to Z, and then it repeats it with Eliezer saying, a narrative from A to Z. Now, the Torah does not waste words. The Torah could have simply said in one sentence, one Pasuk, Eliezer told Lavan everything that happened. But that's not the way the narrative works. It doesn't say Eliezer told Lavan everything that happened. It says Eliezer told Lavan A, B, C, D. There's a lot of arichos, a lot of repetition, a lot of redundancy. And the Torah doesn't want to waste words. So the Gemara in Chulin remarks, in a very abbreviated way, that Hashem cherishes every aspect of the lives of the Avos, and even the slaves of the Avos, more than the, all of the Torah of the children. Because with respect to us, Hashem may communicate major, major mitzvos, halachos, by an extra word, an extra letter. The Torah is not going to bother to spell it out if you could infer it from a letter. Right? Many halachas are darshans from this letter, this word, etc. But when it comes to the avos, God does not uh, squint on it. God, uh, skimp on it rather, God will mention every single little detail. Which means, the Gemara in says, redundancy is a symbol of affection. Talk, let's go over the details again and again and again. But Barbanel points out a very important clow that we have to be aware of. Whenever the Torah repeats a story, it never repeats the story the same way. There will always be differences. Details will be added. Details will be left out. There may be contradictions. There may be inconsistencies. 
So it's not enough to simply focus on the repetition. You have to focus on the differences. And the differences will be the key of why there was a repetition. Because it's not really a repetition. It's a different story. And the Torah wants to convey that different story. The Abarbanel himself identifies, I believe, no fewer than 50 differences in the various versions. We're not going to go over uh, all 50. Some of them are very small, but you know, he, he notices them. Careful reading. But I want to point out uh, three, four, five, again, I we'll, we'll lose count, but a few major differences in how the themes are presented. Difference number one is the definition of the mission. Avram calls Eliezer, his faithful servant, to him. And he says to Eliezer, I want you to swear to me that you will not take a daughter of Canaan, you will not take a Canaanite uh, for my son Yitzchak, but you will go el artsi umoladati. You will go to my land and my place of birth. And we'll discuss why that's so, but Avram is very adamant, not here. Even though, even though there were actually were some righteous Canaanites that theoretically might have been eligible. Avram had three very dear friends who were Canaanites. Oner, Eshko, Umamre. And I mentioned last week that Mamre was the one who convinced him to do the Brit Mila publicly. But Avram is saying, nope, not from Aner, Eshko, and Mamre. And of course, there was another candidate who could have been a very good candidate. Eliezer himself. Eliezer, the faithful servant of Avram. Eliezer had a daughter. Eliezer was hoping that maybe his daughter could be kind of the aim who would, establish, who would help establish Klal Yisrael. And Avram even rejects Eliezer. Again, the language is, Ain Oror, the Canaanites are Oror, the Canaanites are cursed. We'll, we'll try to explain that. But uh, Noah cursed Ham, who was the father of Canaan. And the Jewish nation, Avram's nation, Avram's seed are blessed. Avarechacha. So Ain Oror, Misdabek Babarach. The cursed cannot connect to the blessed. So he tells Eliezer, go to my land and my place of birth. So remember these words, artsi umoladati. When Eliezer communicates his conversation with Avram to Lavan later, he changes the words. Instead of artsi umoladati, it's beis avi umishpachti, my father's house and my family. Meaning, Avram expressed the mission based on geography, going to a location. Eliezer converted the geography to family. He didn't quote Avram's words exactly. Instead of artsi umoladati, he said base of v umishpachti. That's difference number one. The mission was different. Difference number two. Eliezer comes to Haran, Avram's place of origin, and you know we're basically Syria, maybe north of Syria. And of course, Chazal talk about the miracle of Kvitza Saderech, of the uh, the road shrinking, or against Machlokas, if Kvitza Saderech means the road shrinks, or you have you're a magic carpet, you go at super speed. But whatever it is, he got there very quick. Okay, and he immediately has to devise a test. Who is the suitable person? Now, the Mepharshim already raised the question, uh, isn't this a problem of superstition? Like you say, the, the first uh, girl that's wearing a red dress or the first uh, girl that has a black hat. No, this is Kishuf, this is magic, this is superstition. So the Mepharshim say no. This is not, 
If this would have been, you know, the first girl wearing a red dress or uh, has a bow in her hair, that would be superstition because who says that's what God shows? This was a test of character. This was a test of midot. In other words, Avram sent him there because he's supposed to look for some quality. Eliezer defined that quality, although he was not told explicitly, to be a loving kindness, chesed. So he quite logically devises a test that demonstrates a capacity of chesed. That people are drawing water. I go up to a young girl and I ask her to give me water and give my camels water. And if that person does that without complaint, the saver upon him yafos, that's a pretty good indicator that this is the right person. Now, Eliezer said that the woman that I say Give me, give me and my camels to drink. That is the woman that you prepared for Yitzchak. Now, did Rivka carry out exactly what Eliezer said? She actually did not. Because what she did was she drew water for him. She told him to drink. And then she said, I'll go back and refill the water for your camels. Now he didn't say that. He said the woman that says, I will give you and your camels is the right woman. But Rivka didn't say, I'll give you and your camels. She gave him and then she went back and filled for the camels. So she did not fulfill the test Exactly, but she did better. She did better. What she did demonstrates a higher level of chesed. Why, why is that so? Because number one, when you say to a person, I will fill up the water for you and your camels, you know, there's kind of an implication. You're like your animals. She had kavot for the human being in which this is for you. After you are taken care of, I will then take care of your animals. So her behavior was greater. And the other reason would be that if you're told this water is for you and your animals, you might be reluctant to drink your fill because some of it has to go to the animals. She didn't want Eliezer to feel. He was in a state of he couldn't drink all he wanted. So... Did Rivka do exactly what Eliezer proposed? No, she did not. But that was not a problem because she did better. She didn't get 100. She got 120. She got extra credit. So she certainly demonstrated the chesed. Now, when Eliezer is recounting the story to Lavan, he makes the correspondence more exact than it actually was. He actually says, I had said the woman that draws water for me and my animals... That's the right woman. And behold, she drew water for me and my animals. In other words, he made the correspondence more exact than it actually was. The correspondence was not exact. But Eliezer made it fit more than it actually did. That's a, a second difference. A third difference is... That in his conversation with Avram, Eliezer raises the question, what if the woman doesn't want to come back? Shall I take your son there? And Avram said, no, under, very emphatically, under no circumstances shall you take my son out of Eretz Israel. You know, Zavram is saying, I don't want my son to be associated with anybody there in terms of the family or, or, or leaving Eretz Israel. When he recounts this to Lavan, he soft pedals it. In other words, uh, when I asked my master, what if the woman doesn't want to go? So my master said, Hashem will make everything, everything will turn out for the good. Meaning, he didn't say the words, don't take my son there. He leaves it out. A fourth difference 
is the sequence of the jewelry. In the actual story that happens, as soon as Eliezer sees that Rivka gave him to drink and the camels to drink, he immediately gives her the jewelry to betroth him, to Yitz, betroth her to Yitzchak. And only afterwards does he ask her, oh, by the way, Basmiat, um, who is your father? He didn't ask until he already essentially betrothed her. By contrast, when Eliezer recounts the story to Laban, he says, after she passed the test, I asked her Basmiat, and only when she said, I am the daughter of Besuel, did I then give her the jewelry. Now Rashi explains, because Eliezer didn't want to be seen as foolish. If Eliezer would have said, I gave her the jewelry, and then I asked her, Basmiat, Lovin would have said, well, how could you give jewelry to the person? You don't know she's the right family. So Eliezer had to make, it, had to make the story that it made sense. But wait a second. If the story doesn't make sense, then why did Eliezer do it that way? Eliezer gave the jewelry without asking Basmiat. Right? So these are a number of discrepancies in the account. So here is what uh, is suggested by some of Farshim. It said, Avram Avinu was not insisting that the Shidduch be from his family. It can't be with the Canaanites, but he wanted it to be from his place, his place of origin. That's why he said, go to my land. He didn't say go to my family. Avram Avinu was concerned with geography. Why is that so? What was so miyuchad about Avram Avinu's place of Haran? So the Drasha Haran says a very important yisod. It's a very important yisod that we should think about in marriage, generally. You know, Avram rejected Eliezer. Avram rejected Eliezer. Now, how could that be? Eliezer was righteous. Eliezer was a tzaddik. Eliezer was Avram's faithful Talmud. And who is the people in Avram's place? They're idol worshippers. They're pagans. Is Avram a racist? Is he preferring his family or his city to holy and righteous people? So says the Drasha Saran, the one thing that Avram knew about his family or his place even is they were kind-hearted. They were compassionate. They had midos. The Canaanites by nature were cruel. That's the meaning of being cursed. Cruel. So says the Drusha Saran, I'm not giving you this as a halacha, but just something to think about. It is better to take someone from a family of idolaters who has a kind heart than to take a person who's totally from but has cruelty. Because when a person is an Ovid Avodazara, they have a wrong philosophy of life. They're ideas they don't understand. But ideas can be changed. You can be educated. You can grow. But mitos, mitos can also be changed. And we have to assume Eliezer worked on his mitos. We have to make that assumption. But the changes are much more difficult. And you never know if they're permanent. So perhaps there would be a resurgence of that Canaanite cruelty in later generations that would be a spiritual blemish, an impurity, a cancer within Klau Yisrael. So the Drusha Saran is saying that the most important thing to look for in a Shidduch is chesed, kindness, a good heart. Uh, you know, again, I, I think about this when I think about contemporary shidduchim uh, in the in the religious world. You know, people will ask, "Well, does he wear a black hat or uh, whatever it would be? Uh, does the girl ever wear denim?" You know, you know, you know. Which again, there's no there's no halacha against denim. To be frank, I mean, I don't know what principle is involved there, uh, but these are things that are deal breakers. No, but midos tovos, kindness. Good heart. People pay less attention to that. And the Drusha Saran says, this is the Yesod HaKol. And this is how Eliezer knew what to look for. Because, again, 
Avram didn't tell Eliezer what to look for. Avram just said, go to my place. So how did Eliezer know to devise a test about the water? Answer, because he knows. Why is Avram sending me to his place? Because they're balei chesed. That's why he's sending me here. And the Canaanites are not. Therefore, the test I have to devise is connected to the magnitude of chesed. So according to the run, Avram is not telling Eliezer Bedafka to go to his family. He's telling Eliezer, go to Haran because they're gomle chasadim. And that's the quality that we have to have to build a Jewish nation. So in terms of this, Eliezer doesn't have to know. In other words, Eliezer's behavior is very logical. As soon as the woman passes the test, he gives her the jewelry. And then he asks Basmiat. He didn't have to know Basmiat before he gave her the jewelry because his mission was not family-based. It was location-based, which in turn was character-based. Ah, but here's the thing. Eliezer has to be a salesman. Eliezer you know, winds up with a young girl, according to Chazal. She was only three years old, quite amazing. Other midrashim say 14 years old. But I don't think there's any measures that puts her older than 14 years old. So it's anywhere between 3 and 14. And there's going to be a problem that they're not going to want to let her go. to far away. So Eliezer has to convince them that this is God's will. So a lot of Eliezer's deviations are lies in order to facilitate the success of his mission to be able to redeem her from that tuma and bring her into Kedusha. So here's the thing. Avram, of course, was very famous. Avram was wealthy. Avram was influential. Avram was respected. So one of the ways you, uh, you flatter up the Muchutanim is you say, oh, the great Avram sent me all the way here because he wanted a shidduch with you. In other words, he couldn't just say, Avram sent me to find somebody from Haran. Yeah, Avram was indifferent. Find somebody from Haran. But he couldn't go to Lavan and say, oh, he sent me to find somebody from Haran. That's not very impressive. But if it's you, that appeals to the ego. So, Answer to question one. Avram said, go to my land. Eliezer said, go to my family. Reason? He wanted to appeal to Lavan's ego that the great Avram wanted them, Bedavka. Even though that wasn't the case, but this would be a case where it's mutter to be Mishana, to deviate, to accomplish a much greater good. Now, Everyone who lies, anyone who's lied as a child, hopefully you don't lie as an adult, knows that the first rule of lying is you got to keep your story consistent. Meaning if you change one detail, you got to change another detail. Otherwise they don't fit. So once Eliezer changed the mission from geography to family, he had to change his account of the sequence of the jewelry versus the basmia. Meaning, when his mission was only a mission for geography, get somebody from Haran, that's a balatz chesed, he could give her the jewelry without uh, knowing who she was. But once he says to Lavan that the mission is, I got to find a specific person from a specific family, he can't say, I gave her the jewelry and then I asked who she was. Because Lavan would rightfully say, how did she know she was our family? So Eliezer had to make it consistent by saying, I asked who she was. And I didn't give her the jewelry. Until. You see, it's a, a very good example of changing the sequence to be consistent with the other change that you did. Now, 
we go further with this, I had mentioned Eliezer devised a test. The woman that says, I will give you and your camels to drink. That's the right woman. Rivka didn't do that. Rivka gave him to drink and then went back for the camels. Now, Eliezer's purpose in devising the test was to show chesed. And even though Rivka did not 100% do exactly what he said, she showed chesed to a greater degree. But with Lavan, he's using the test for a different purpose. Not to show kindness, but to show kind of almost a superstitious omen thing. Because Lavan, over there, but Azari generally, were very superstitious people. And they believed in omens. And they believed in signs. And they believed in magical thinking. And therefore Eliezer is saying, we see that God or the gods, whoever love and believes in, want this to be so because I devised a test and it was complied with 100%. Now, if you're testing for character, 120% is better than 100%. And Rifka did it as 120%. But if you're testing for omens, Omens have to be exact. If omens are not exact, they're not omens anymore. So therefore, Eliezer cannot just say, oh, I said he who gives me and the camels, and she gave me, and then she got for the camels. That's not going to work. That's not an omen. That's not exact. So Eliezer has to make it exact by saying she did exactly. In other words, the point basically is that Eliezer has a mission. And Eliezer changes a number of details in order to maximize the success of his mission. Avram is looking not for family. Avram is looking for character. Avram is looking for Midas. And if it wouldn't be his family, that would be okay also. But in order to appeal to love one's vanity, it has to change into a specific request for a family and that necessitates a change in every, other, in every other detail. Now, this highlights yet another final point I want to mention. And that is the famous drasha that Rashi brings. Uh, that Eliezer himself had a daughter. And he was hoping that Avram would allow Yitzchak to marry Eliezer's daughter. Where do we learn that from? Where is that alluded to in the Chumash? The answer is because when Eliezer raises the question, Ulai lo sove ha'ishalalechas, perhaps the woman won't want to go, shall I bring your son there? Now the word Ulai is normally spelt with a vav, but in the Chumash it is spelt without a vav, and it could be read Eli to me to me. Ulai Eli, the double entendre. But it's interesting that the double entendre that I have a daughter and Avram rejected me only appears in the account to Lavan. In the actual conversation he has with Avram, the word Ulai is spelt with a vav and it only has one meaning, perhaps. Here you see also a very, very deep point. Eliezer, obviously, we don't know exactly, but Eliezer must have been heartbroken that all of his faithful service to Avram is not counting in his favor. And not only that, but he's the guy. He's the person who has to find the replacement for his own daughter. <clears throat> But he's so committed to Avram Shalichus that he's willing to communicate his humiliation to Laban if that would make it more successful. In other words, essentially, he's telling Laban, Avram rejected me, the faithful, loyal, devoted disciple. Avram rejected me in favor of you. Look at how great you guys are. Do you see the sacrifice here? Eliezer didn't have to do this. First of all, look at the remarkable trust Avram is reposing in Eliezer. 
Eliezer has every incentive to torpedo the mission. Because after all, Avram did say, if they refuse to go, you're not going to take my son there. Well, that puts Eliezer back in the, uh, in the competition. Potentially. So number one, Eliezer could have just sabotaged the whole mission. And Avram was certainly aware that that could happen. But not only did Eliezer not sabotage the mission, Eliezer could have just described things exactly as they occurred. And that would have been fine, and that might have sabotaged the mission. He went beyond being accurate to maximize its success. Such loyalty, such amazing commitment to Avram Avinu and everything Avram Avinu represented. He understood, I'm not sure emotionally, but at least intellectually, that the Canaanite cannot connect to Am Yisrael. And this was his Akedah. As great as he was, he understood that connection could not exist. And he did everything he humanly could to maximize success of the mission. And by the way, this explains, I had mentioned that in the conversation to Avram, Eliezer asked Avram, what if the woman doesn't want to go? And Avram said, chas v'shalom, don't take him there. He doesn't mention that to love him. For very good reason. If you're trying to butter up the mechutanim, you don't want to say, oh, by the way, my master said uh, he never wants his son to set foot in your house. That's not, that's not a way that's conducive to appeal to the ego. And the final ha'ara here is a ha'ara of the marshal. An amazing ha'ara. I've said maybe a hundred times more than that, Eliezer, Eliezer, Eliezer. Well, look at Parshas Chayisara and tell me where is Eliezer's name mentioned it is not mentioned. We know from Parshas Lech Lecha that Avram had a servant whose name was Eliezer, but Avram had many servants. The yeah. The only thing it says here is the Eved Avram. It does not mention him by name. He's not mentioned by name. The Marshal says the Torah doesn't mention Eliezer by name because Eliezer was so devoted to this mission that he obliterated his own identity. He did not exist as an individual. The ultimate Evet. By the way, just as a little aside, he's called the Evet of Avram. He kind of obliterated himself to Avram. And the truth is, Maishu Rabbeinu, of course, is called the Evet Hashem. And the Radak says, that by an Eved, the rule is, Masha Kona Eved Kona Rabo. Whatever an Eved owns is owned by his master. Maisha Rabbeinu had many, many amazing abilities. Everything that he had, he gave to Hashem. In terms of Eliezer's relationship to Avram, it was the same thing. Now, there are wild midrashim that you have to try to assimilate here that actually connect Eliezer to Og Melech Habashan, right? Og, Og is an interesting figure who kind of appears all over the place. Before the Mabo, he survives the Mabo. Uh, he becomes, he morphs into Eliezer Eved Avram. Uh, but again, as I say, most understand that we don't mean Og and Eliezer are the same person, but it means there are commonalities in their neshama that have to be analyzed. But be it as it may, the bottom line marriage lessons that we learn uh, from this is the great, great importance of Midos Tovos, of Lev Tov, of Chesed. We focus so much, or young people focus so much, on a lot of externalities. They make up all sorts of marriage lists. 100 things that I want in my marriage partner, etc. And, you know, a lot of times uh, we could tell, well, just get rid of the first 95, uh, or whatever, get rid of 95 out of 100. But the Midos Tovas are much more important, the Ron says. Again, I'm not giving you, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm not telling a person, uh, oh, marry a Messianic Jew because they have a good heart. I mean, I mean there, there, there are going to be limits as to how far you could go, of course. But we need to understand that the Ron says 
better someone from a family of idolatry who is a lover of chesed than someone from the most religious environment that does not have that love of chesed. Because the love of chesed is much harder to acquire. Not that it's impossible. We believe midos can always be improved. But it's a much more difficult thing. As opposed to frumkite. Frumkite, you know, can be acquired. You can acquire it in various ways. So that's an important lesson for us. And Be'ezus Hashem, uh, we should be zaycha to have our marriages move in that direction. And uh, those who have to get married, Be'ezus Hashem, they should be zaycha to find shiduchim uh, that emphasize the lev tov and the chesed. And in that way, they build a bias neman on Israel. Yes, you're